this is from this book, Ahead of Others. Uh, it's, it's the adventures of, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Adventures of uh, uh, an Israeli boy, a Jewish boy in, in the Muslim heaven, who's blown up by a suicide bomber and he goes to the wrong heaven and he has to kind of find his way back to, uh, to the heaven of his own belief, which he finds out actually doesn't exist, and I gave it away so you don't even have to read it or buy it. <laughs> um, the, this section that, that, that I'm going to read uh, actually has absolutely nothing to do with that. It's the one part of the book that's uh, the boy, his name is Jonathan Schwartzstein, his, his memory of, um, of being alive. Um, and what he really remembers is this walk he used to take with his father uh, in Jerusalem, down Yaffa Road to the, the Western Wall. Uh, he used to take this walk with his father. And the section is called Shoes, and it's written uh, like a shoelace. It overlaps, and the end is the beginning, sort of. So, Shoes. He lives on Chernofsky Street, Jerusalem. That helps him a lot. Shoes, 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 and shoes to pair good measure. There were always shoes, never a shoe. No one in my house had ever said shoe, had ever said I can't find a shoe, had ever said I lost my shoe, as in just the word, like singularly all alone, or even asked where the expletive is my shoe, asked have you ever seen, smelled, or touched its pleather? Tasted your own foot in your mouth and its shoe along with it? Heard its sneaker from behind and approach? No. And never, when you decompressed, but calmed yourself enough to ask, what have you done with my shoe? Or where has my shoe walked off to? Ever. Shoe was shoes. Shoes were to be kept together, preferably to the queen, that's his mother, to be kept tied together, two shoelaces left knotted, strangling one another as in the morning of our fingers would worry them separate, apart, loose and achy. Their laces to lie exhausted upon the lemon-mocked linoleum gasping for air. Limp, and then finally, maybe once a season for me when I was living and growing, maybe only every five, six, or even every ten or so years for Abba, this is father, and the queen, when they died, when the shoes died, they would be tied together again, then bagged to go to the poor. In bags of plastic brought home from the mega hypermarket, built atop the grave of Pierre Koenig. I never knew who he was until now, though I knew Pierre Koenig's street. He was a general versus the Nazis in Africa, and then the poor, whoever they were. I never knew the poor, but the poor knew my shoes, made for Kazakh feet, for Ethiopian feet on a boy probably three years younger than I once was. For them, for whom they'd still be small and pinching. A shoe for their foot, the pores. One huge hungry shoe-sucking, lace-slurping monster when ex with an exilian stomp tromping feet. My son should study, Abba always said, my son should study the podiatry of wandering. All of the pedestrian interpretations of Exodus and then he laughed until the queen slapped him on the back as broad as that of an ox. But I, at not ten nine years, had had the opportunity to study nothing at all until the first fully naked girl, this is the section where he meets the virgins in heaven, they don't know what his shoes are, I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip. <laughs> Understand that when Abba had to buy new shoes, when he was in the market for replacement footwear, as he said that morning, that that was an event of maybe twice a childhood, once in my life. That's why we were at the site of my death, he was born at a shoe store, an event too, once in my life. A tenth birthday as well, not to forget, but before the toy, it was shoes. Because yesterday is yesterday, a nail had come hungry and toothed flesh. Another pair fit for the poor, which won't fit. A hundred, hundred shoe boxes upended from my grave, a footstone. But my shoes are still alive, Abba had said that morning over coffee for him and tea for the queen. He'd said that his shoes were still living. There's a potentiality for resurrection at the very least. No, not your shoes. The queen was always right. She had to be. She said that his shoes were sick, terminally sick, flatlining, from blip, blip, bleep to one long sheet. Your arches are falling in, not sandstone, but Abba's, and the next sheet, the lamb, the spotless calf, that was me, the healthiest one, and the whitest. A sheep, 
with an Abba for an Abba, who wore dead cows on his feet. He walked dead always more. Skip a little. Abba said, shoes first. You'll get your toy later. Shoes. Abba said we were in the market for shoes. For him, the queen insisted, we had to get shoes for him because Abba had walked his old shoes out to nail, to salt to nail, because he walked his old souls dead, and if he wasn't on his toes, then his feet along with them. Soon, the son of enough. Sky the toenail under which he walked them to thin, at least they'd agree, the soul of the earth. Salted so as nothing would ever again grow from its grave. A coffinless coffin's nail was hurting him in his walk from his bedroom. Through the hallway lined with photographs, expecting, inspecting each one individually for level hang on his run to the bathroom, where he'd spend, they feel like, hours resting his eyes on the newspaper. The queen had slipped under the door a moment after its arrival, much, much, much earlier, when the large print was understood by her to be explained away to me later after I woke up from school. Then walks from the bathroom through the hallway back to his bedroom again, which was theirs, to dress leaving the bathroom under the guard of his stench, which the queen always hated, or else just said she, she did, but which I always found invitingly pleasant. His bathroom was nose-warming, congenially flushing of the congenital sinus. Then he rushed back from his bedroom to the bathroom for less time to be sitting in his reek, again the queen always said reek, after which he walked through the hallway again and further now down to the kitchen where he sat for the breakfast the queen always made, which he ate and drank coffee while he read the back of the paper, the sports, the arts, the arts again. As the queen only after serving Abba and me, serving herself instant coffee or tea, she read the front of the paper again, which are the headlines which tell you the importance of the day or of yesterday, and what will not happen now or cannot ever hope upon hopes happen again, to walk through the hallway from the kitchen to the front door, where he walked right into his shoes, walking painfully, on, waiting painfully on the, mat, on the mat that said the word shalom. We always wipe our shoes on and then just step all over. He opened the front door and walked out with a kiss for each of us, put the queens on one cheek of two sumptuously risen loaves, Though mine was always on my forehead, on the head even then grow out of my forehead and right out the front door, but out of which what walking and where I did not know exactly, precisely. I did not know to the step this walking, the queen said, all over the whole world, creation of, listen, why do you do that to yourself, was what she always asked. Why are you walking? Why don't you take a staff position at the Symphony Philharmonic Orchestra or at the opera? And I would always answer her by saying that he had enough opera at home, particularly Richard Strauss. And so a freelancer, he was a freelancer, and to remain a true freelancer, as opposed to a staff jobber, because he was a tuner. He was a piano tuner. Abba always said, I don't want to tune the same pianos month after month. I want to tune different pianos, as many as possible. I want to redeem to save as many as possible pianos. That's the job of a piano tuner, Abba always said, meaning he often joked, a failed pianist. Then the queen would stare at him evilly, then hug him tight. But we didn't have a piano in our apartment on Chernofovsky Street because Abba wouldn't allow a big black cancer noise to interfere with his life, Abba once said. And I just now remember that my Abba once also told me that when two strings are mathematically perfectly in tune, they actually sound discordant. And that the job of a piano tuner is to tune a piano, Abba once said, the strings of a piano, Abba once said, intentionally discordant, knowledgeably dissonant, slightly, Abba once said, ever so slightly, and that only then will all the strings sound as they should, in perfect, total harmony, when the hammers come crash-pedaling down, Abba once said. But after the queen had enabled his enabling, saving some more, then let him go. Huggins let him lose her kiss, blah, 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 blah. I didn't know where he went. Rather, I knew that he went to the Symphony Philharmonic Orchestra and to piano showrooms and music stores throughout Jerusalem and even Greater Tel Aviv, and to grandmother's attics and basements and cellars, to hospitals, schools, and theaters, and fancy French Italian restaurants. And also, though not as much as he wanted to, to the opera and ballet and conservatory. But I had never been to any of those places. Not to the Philharmonic, neither to piano showrooms, nor to music stores, and all my grandparents were dead. As dead as music, Abba used to say, and our apartment on Chernofovsky Street, though we had a garden and tree, did not have an attic or basement or even a cellar, and thank God I've never been in a hospital. But then neither, neither have I ever been to the, ye to the theater, not Yiddish or Shakespearean, nor to fancy French Italian restaurants as starry as the size of Al-Khwarizmi. He's an Arab uh, astronomer, he mentioned earlier. 
Let's say you're to the, the Strauss Opera. I've never been to the Stravinsky or Tchaikovsky Ballet or to the conservatory of conservatories to clap, clap concerts because I will want to need to be a lawyer or a professor of history or to speak his parents' language, which was German at the university. Abba also walked to to tune. Walking himself like a toony string, Abba once said, he walked around loosening, slackening throughout the day, then tightening up to pure pitch again nearer to home, to truest pitch at the corner of Chernihovsky Street, then walked from the university to the Schwitz, and then after, walked to his friend Tannenbaum's house, which was a real house, not just an apartment, three floors, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, with an open kitchen, the queen would always say when she was jealous. It has an open kitchen. When she was jealous for a moment of peace, a cup of coffee, tea, maybe a dip of vodka with Slivovitz after and she walked back home to Chernikovsky Street in our apartment building outside of which I'd wait in the doorway and always impatiently for him to pick me up for our every Sunday, Sunday afternoon walk into the old city of Jerusalem. We entered always to the Jaffa Gate, past David the King, about whom Otto once told me that in 1889, and he said, I think it was maybe 1898, don't quote me, that's when this rampart was demolished. It was destroyed, look here. And the moat that used to poison around it was filled up to prepare for the arrival, for the triumphant arrival, Abba once said, of Kaiser Wilhelm II, as a guest of the Sultan of Turkey. And so that's what that huge hole in the wall, Abba had said, was. That's what it is as we walked into the old city, that huge gaping void in the high sun of wall, telling me all about Herod and the three towers of Faisal, Marinay, and Pippicus, Abba said, as we walked deeper into the old city. But then, instead of further history about a huddle deal to it, Huddle deal doing and the sea sighting. Instead of further history, which is further explanation, further enlightenment or illumination, Abba abruptly stopped and said to me this once Ignore all that trash, though we used a much stronger word. Ignore all this rubble. Ignore these names and dates that are only the many names we use to individuate in the visible time, Yoni. Save them for later. I want you, Abba said, wincing to instead observe all these tourists, and only the tourists, as we walked with Abbas talked, observe all these tourists, don't sit in judgment of them, just remove yourself, he said. Stand still at a distance that comes from being native to a world of this foul language, wonderful Yoni, and take all of it in. Look over there, the French and the German, always the youngest Germans Germany can afford to export. Two rows of ten each with matching yellow trim tote bags, the umbrella-wielding Italians with their compact designer umbrellas or their umbrellas. And then look at the Polish. Look at that tiny group of tiny Polish nuns being shepherded past. Looks like a herd of miniature nun donkeys. Pardon you, problem, don't you think, Yoni? All these donkeys ridden by all these midgetized, glandular problem nuns. As in a defensive maneuver against this incoming phallus of teenage Greeks. Mind your step. Each face of theirs is the floor of an obsolete oil price being rolled, their eyes looking like the stomping of grapes yelling, don't forget to bow to the British. Look at them with their cement teeth and concrete rollers being guided past us by an American as we walk, Ab and I holding hands with the Italians, the Japanese, and the Korean. God, what ideas do they have, Abba asked. And the Americans. Yes, Abba said. As we walked, Abba and I with my face tunneling into his armpit, Soaking up the Tanabam's vodka, Abba was sweating, the smell of rotting prehistoric, Abba said, Pleistocene fish, the street always paved us with. Yoni, observe the Americans, was what Abba said. For example, they're fat. It simply obliterates any waste. It quite simply absolves the figure of the American of form. And then their intentions, for instance, which are immaculate as their collective and yet anonymous conscience, Abba said. Look how many t-shirts they buy here, Yoni. Enumerate them. T-shirt after t-shirt after shirt after cruciform tee, all in the shape of that Jew we once crucified up on the hill, at which Abba pointed a finger as if accusing the very set of the sun. All these shirts for them and their relations and their unshaped fat, actually unshaped at all, Abba said, labelliform bodies, the father, the son, and the globoid. God, how many bodies do Americans have? How many bodies does it take to make one American? Abba asked. Well, one body's here torn in Jerusalem, the cargo of being for a holy sepulcher in the church. Another body's back home building missiles. Some other bodies lined up in the local kindergarten to vote. And yet another body's stuck in neutral in the drive-in. We're out basking on the southernmost beach in southern in southernmost beach in central Florida, or else plus pressed up against Minnie Mouse's plasticine nipplelessness, Abba said. <laughs> That must be why they need so many t-shirts. This must be what they need them for all of their bodies, for all these bodies going every which way at once. 
That's why they hoard them. They compliment each other on them, the shirts. And in America, in which it's not polite to compliment a fellow American on his or especially her body or bodies, on threat of, let's say, prosecution, incarceration, capital punishment, child compiler, but in which it's more than permissible to compliment them on their t-shirts, Abba said. Just hear them, Yoni, will you? Just listen to them. You can save yourself all the money in the universe and all those Hollywood movies. Pick up on the dialogue, the ropes, not at all to the tropes, just by listening in and then smell them, Yoni. Smelllessness. They're deodorized. They have no whiff whatsoever. They're without any scent at all. As if they're not really animals, just like everyone else, like me, Abba said, or like you, or else if the season, second, of spring, if you can imagine it, Abba asked, Lasting a whole year and around again, and to get another spring, Abba said. They smell like a thousand months of a million moons of the month of Adar, six months ago, and it's Purim, until the world just pops, pops fat out of its box on the calendar, on the wall in the kitchen, Abba said to me. As if all the days of Nissan and their Abba said pessimist nights had been sent spinning down into his mouth for him to laugh them down into himself, Abba laughed again and again, until we had reached the hotel, the Western Wall, at which my Abba's laugh became a light hack. Despite the walk, he always smoked. No less American blues was his brand, and the occasional, occasionally stinky cheroot. Then became this deep wheeze, I thought it was, until I realized his laugh had turned in his gut to spring up through his throat into a seriousness I'd never previously known, Abba hazarded, with the heaviest of lips, until his laugh, 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 had turned and almost imperceptibly into the word ma'arav, was what Abba said in the language we used to speak together whenever we spoke. Abba said ma'arav ever so faintly, again and again. He said ma'arav, which means in every language, west, Abba said, west, 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 west. Thank you.